Hello, good afternoon, and uh, welcome. Welcome to the lunchtime uh, afternoon talk of uh, Tilo Herlock, Simon Hodman, and Simon from Weiler. Uh, known to get collectively known as Herlock, Hodman, from Weiler, or HHF. Um, before the introduction, I think Moisen already mentioned this Friday at 6.30, there will be the lecture of the Swiss curator Hans Ulrich Obers, the director, co-director of the Serpentine Gallery at 6.30. Please come. Um, but today, to introduce HHF, I'd like to start off with uh, two quotes. Uh, the, th the first one is from the movie The Third Man from 1949, uh, where the, um, the Harry Lyme, the character played by Orson Welles, said, in Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. Uh, in Switzerland, they had brotherly love, they had 500 years of democracy and peace, and what did they produce? The cuckoo clock. <laughs> this is 1949, okay. Um, the, the second quote is from uh, Rem Kuhas, um, from our faculty, uh, when he was describing the scene of the Architecture Association in London between 1970 and 1972, which I hope maybe Moisen and Alex could attest to. Rem Kuhas said, it, it was a school awash in sex, drugs, and rock and roll. David Bowie was hanging out at the bar, flashed to a person with experimental hysteria quickened by the visionary projects of Archigram, architecture's answer to the Beatles, galvanized by the European action politics of May 1968. Anything goes, everything goes. For studio, write a book if you want. Dance or piss in your pants if you want. Structure or codes or HVAC, go to Switzerland. I, I mean, I, I, I always wanted to use these two quotes to introduce a Swiss architect, but I, I never dared to. But I think HHF has the stomach to, uh, to handle that. You know, and, and, and there's no doubt, you know, I think there's a, these are stereotypes, you know, it's, uh, it's not one dimensional. I remember there was a quote that Rem Kohas wrote about Herzog Damron early on in the career. And he was talking about the tension between this uh, Jack Herzog's persona, this explosiveness, in, in, in regards to this restraint of the architecture, talk about this dialectics, that there's explosiveness inside and there's a restraint on the outside that somehow directed the work. And, and for me, HHF is Swiss, but they're an anomaly. They have this explosiveness, but almost this explosiveness is introver it's extroverted. It's kind of flipped out, whether there's an intensity in the interior. So, you know, when you look at the work, they're different from many of the Swiss architects. They're far away from this kind of Protestant restraint, conformity, or, or politeness that's usually associated with Swiss architecture, and more importantly, far away from this type of certainty. Um, I've learned a lot from them. You know, they have been friends since um, we were invited to the Ordos 100 project more than 10 years ago by Ai Weiwei. Um, uh, many of our faculty were involved, Herzog Damron, Toshiko, Scott, uh, many of us were involved in that project. Uh, none, none got built. But uh, at the end, I, I realized that maybe I, there was never Ai Weiwei's intention. I think his main intention is to have 100 architects trapped in a holiday inn in Mongolia. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I have to say, when I look back the last 10 years, I think many projects stem from that relationship, stem from those events. You know, many of us had known each other's work from a distance, but we didn't have the tete-a-tete -tete meeting, and then I think many collaborations actually stem from that, that kind of historical Autos 100 event. Um, but, but throughout the years, we have collaborated together. I mean, I learned a lot from them in terms of, I remember learning about um, Eastern European architecture, uh, Bruslav Fuchs, you know, in the, Czech, the Czech architect, or the, the Yugoslavian socialist monuments. I saw Simon at the opening of the, the MoMA show Toward the Concrete Utopia. I strangely find you and your work situate very nicely within the show. You know, I always try to understand some of the sensibilities that, that's underlying the work beyond geographical cultural boundaries. And I, I see a certain type of this Eastern European socialist work or this kind of deliberate awkwardness and brutalism in your work that I appreciate a lot. They also distinguish you from a lot of the architects around you of, of your generation. I think one thing that is particular of their practice is their relentless way of finding collaborators and collaborations. Certainly, it's marked by a series of incredibly successful collaborations with Ai Weiwei early on in their career, like the Five Houses, the Zai Residence in New York, or the Art Farm. 
Uh, more recent projects includes the award-winning uh, museum and viewing platform in the park in, in the suburbs of Paris with AWP. Um, they are working on the reconstruction of the Socialist Monument in Montenegro with Sada Vuga, and also a, a award-winning project with Tatiana Bilbao in a mixed-use complex in Strasbourg. They have built in Switzerland, China, Germany, France, USA, and this year they are the design critics of our option studio here at the GSD. So please join me to welcome HHF. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, what an honor, and I mean, I'm, I'm still grinning because of this uh, beautiful introduction and the, the link to the, all these uh, architectures of the uh, Yugoslav uh, period we like so much, and um, yes, we also feel that. There is something which is definitely not Swiss, whether it's Yugoslav, but definitely there is something which is, um, uh, or it's at least not so important to us. Um, we, will, we are not so good at um, staying in limits and being Protestant, as you said, and so we will try to just go through the projects, trying to um, make some of you understand some trajectories, some tasks we thought are important for our work, and we will take turns, and maybe we will be too long, and then please, you just have to stop us and go out. This is the three partners, before you have seen the office. Um, the, one of the projects which was uh, kind of uh, on the table in, uh, in the United States was this uh, parking and more here um, in the Chicago Biennial, curated by uh, Mark and Sharon. Um, and um, so it's, uh, I start with uh, showing a few projects very shortly, so you have a, a glimpse uh, on, on the work. This was um, a pretty complex building. It looks like a parking. It has the function of a parking. But as you can see, it is much more than that. It has uh, wellness for those who understand German. This is a slide of like the different programmatic uh, uh, con uh, like, uh, content of the building. Um, so, from culture uh, to, to well-being uh, to, to hotel, everything in an uh, area which uh, you might know because of this uh, big extension, Herzog and um, uh, new building. So, a structure which is built on top of an existing structure which then can go away, which can be a parking, which later then can be something else because it's all but nothing really, so it's a structure which is too big and too heavy for just parkings because it's already dimensioned for uh, what could be another use later with then on top some additional um, work. So for, for us this is an important project even though it was never built because it was um, a, a winning first prize of a competition like this one as well, like this one you just mentioned as well. and. We thought it's important to make you understand that yes, we, I mean, we lose a lot of competitions, but sometimes we also win. And um, this has to do with uh, understanding of the profession of an architect, which is uh, very much linked to tasks. I mean, we get questions on the table and we try to give intelligent answers. And sometimes we fail, sometimes we, we give an answer which is uh, interesting, like this is this Tsai residence, um, upstate New York, um, which was, uh, oh, for once, we have a lot of, um, we not, don't have so many clients with the excellent taste, you know, where then things <laughs> look beautiful like this here, but it happens also. So, um, this is an extension of that guest house. So this is all uh, works where we said we got a task, we got, uh, the, it's the classical work if you want. So someone wants you to build something and you try to figure out how to do and you do the drawings and uh, then it will be built. Um, but on the, our very first construction site was kind of a different thing. So we were not trained to be that classical architect. The very first project was 
in China was a, um, a group project where we did one pavilion, um, many other people involved and uh, orchestrated by Ai Weiwei. And so we never built and we had, uh, were not able to talk Chinese and I mean it's this kind of total um, impossible situation but we said we, we try and so if we try to describe in the best way what we want and they um, know geometry as well as we do we will be able to get what we want so we described with the unfolding like this we were proud that is the the like when you when you start with form Z at that time how to unfold these uh, these boxes you do and then they built it there with really our drawing which were not the drawings of executional drawings. But and they built it, and in the end, it's the building we wanted it to be. And it was the first that was built in that series. It was the only one which somehow was dumb enough and, and stable enough that it would then also just be built and, and is still there. This is a former employee who went there uh, last year. Um, nature is uh, now... Uh, uh, kind of uh, more present in the building, but it's still exactly the building we wanted. This kind of children, mini structure for children was the official name. A building which would be used by the children around that park or in that park to just use the depth of this wall and to, to play with it. So um, this leads me now to this first, um, we try to do chapters, I mean, you will understand if it functions or not, our, our presentation. No? Uh, which leads me to this uh, topic of building as an experiment. No? And um, you mentioned the Yugoslav-like uh, interest. Um, yes, we really think that Yugoslav architecture is one of the high, the peaks of uh, uh, the, the discipline uh, where a lot of complexity and formal will come together to do something which is not nice, but which is uh, incredibly interesting. So one of those people um, who were a, a genius, he's still alive, but um, not in very good terms with us because of this project. Um, Marko Music is one of these uh, geniuses of Yugoslav architecture. He did a lot of uh, important buildings also in, in, the, in the exhibition in MoMA. And uh, he did a project which was uh, 20,000 square meters, so 200,000 square feet uh, building in a very small town um, in Yugoslavia. And then the country failed, the country went, uh, blew up, if you want so, and um, the building was never finished, and nature took over. So this building, we thought, is much better today than it would have ever been if finished. And this is the starting point for a competition we won with the... You see these, it's almost like you go into the Colosseum or so, one of these uh, huge, big buildings, uh, big buildings that um, have just incredible spaces. As you can see, then it's in the middle of nothing, uh, like, like if an extraterrestrial thing, uh, like hit ground. You know? So we thought this is really interesting and this is too big of a problem. They cannot just take that away. So um, we came up with a simple formula of 70%. Just leave it as it is because it's, even if it's, 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 it's good as it is, just make it safe. 20% um, just uh, clean it and, and make it accessible so that you can use what is there and 10% and of plugins. Now, so you see here the red plugins and um, kind of strategic locations of where to do what so that the building is not uh, a problem anymore, that it's not somewhere back in the woods, but it's, it's a, a center for the city. So this is what the, the main space we intended to create. This was then won the competition, was a kind of a public, uh, you know, public process. Um, all the executional drawings and the last time we went there, 
Um, we thought that they started, they, they also started, but they just um, took away the whole structure and put it somewhere else and the whole project failed. No. So it's a, one of these sad stories that you thought you do everything right and you try to make it be an interesting building again, but this dumb mayor of the city who just uh, in a criminal act said, no, I want to have now a, a shopping center and I whatever, and then uh, removes that in the night. And you see that your, build, your intentions were not stable enough that, um, that this could uh, survive a mayor like that. So that's Ordos 100, the big model, one of the big models Mark was talking about. This is the art piece of Ai Weiwei. This is maybe the only complete existence of this project of 100 uh, villas in, in the desert. Um, this for us was uh, an in interesting and important project because yes, I think we would not be here today without this project. So whether these buildings were built or not is not so important to us neither. But we wanted to do something which is as simple as possible and still then answer the question of how to do a project in a group of 100 different projects. And so we were interested by this uh, how people build their own homes in a very simple way and uh, decided that it's really these most uh, simple materials and by just by the extravagance of the, the, the like how to do the roof, um, that we will have this kind of monument to ourselves, HHF, with the rooftop for Google Earth. No? So this, because we thought, I mean, we have to have something which is uh, dealing with, this, with, the, with the question on the table, but it should not be in the way of any inhabitant, because, I mean, it's, it's not so important for the roof. And this was the, um, now I try to, to make you understand that we, I mean, we like to catch up on things we started with the thought, and then maybe next time it will work. We had this Pat who was, uh, I think, a school friend of Simon. And uh, he came to the office and said, uh, I have no money, but I, I'm your biggest fan. I want a building of you in Brazil. So a, a, a guy from Basel in Brazil. And so and then we said, yeah, but no money. I mean, then we cannot really do anything. And uh, in the end, we said, OK, three business flights for the partners to Brazil will make it. And what you will get, you will then just say yes or no, and then you build it yourself. So um, this was the plot. His name is Pat. We did the P, and I mean we we said you can live in any. I mean this is it's fantastic for what you want to do. And so he got the plans, and he went to the builders, and he sent us uh, regularly updates on how he's doing the house. And now it's there, and it's built. No. So this was the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, minimum of what, as architect, you can uh, kind of bring and say, it's, it's, uh, yes, we didn't get really money, but it's, a, it's an interesting um, learning curve of uh, what do you have to control and what not. And this was the backdrop, if you want so, of a project we are now doing in, in uh, Mexico. It's um, Aguas Calientes is the place. Uh, it's a master plan by Tatiana Bilbao. Um, it's one of these group projects. Um, uh, Moss involved and uh, Dogma and Telecamp and so. So it's, it's um, as you can see, it's a strip in the city and the strip is there because there were high tension lines. And um, we had workshops where we did collaborative uh, um, like um, the, the, the master plan of it. And as you can see now here, every color is an office. And we did a, a master plan where always um, offices had to build, be in, ex in exchange with another office in a way that it creates a diversity. So here you see some images of the place. It's not a very lovely place, but it's, um, it's a, um, a it's uh, good and it's, it's, um, uh, we think that with a project like that, we can really contribute to, the, to this neighborhood. It was clear from the beginning that it will be something wild, like this uh, model in the end of 
very different architects. We also knew that it's very difficult to do anything um, in social housing which is not just very uh, structured and very close to, to uh, the most simple. This is research we then did to understand what can you do, uh, I mean, what, what is the potential we saw that you can maybe have two, three things, maybe two things that are not just like the standard box and then um, and then it's the budget is, is gone now. So <clears throat> we had our situation, we had our buildings, we had dogmas, neighbors, moss, Tatiana, and one freestanding. So even if the if the it looks that this um, this checkerboard is very even, um, we understood that it's. Uh, the, according to where you are, you will have very different potential for the interior, interior of your buildings. So what we wanted is to have no such thing as uh, ventilation or whatever technical could be a problem. So we had to get to a pretty crazy shape because you cannot put enough rooms inside the oops, inside the given uh, geometry hat. So if you want so we did um, we did something excuse me which is very much sticking to the program we really read the program we said this is what you want and we will give you what you want and what you describe but because we don't want to have ventilation it will have a pretty uh, extreme shape no and we saw that this is out of the bus there, a photograph. It's, a, it's an area where there are, um, they have a car industry. So they have a car industry, they have metal industry, and they will, and they will Simon shows me the time, it's 12.22. So I should, um, five more minutes. I will, um, so it's an it's a industry which is uh, pretty skillful with metal. So we thought, okay, we have this slope, we have the buildings, we can have one element which is interesting, which is one stair instead of two stairs, and we can then have that as an expressive object. So we have uh, already in itself like two rocks, and then we have one special um, project, one special element in the middle. So you can understand that here. I will just show you now the um, different uh, floor plans and some images. So it's again the most simple way to construct with these blocks of concrete and a little bit of uh, the, the concrete structure. Um, no finishing and uh, control of light. I mean, the control of light and privacy, as we think is interesting for this social housing without having technical installations. That's a building just next to it. So you see that we are not the first ones to try to get a, a special view with a little bit of sticking out. And um, now this is a, this is a collab this is a, a, a image that has been done by Tatiana Bilbao's office to show like all these different projects. Now you see my your project, you see uh, Tatiana's, ours. I mean so, um, and uh, hopefully that will really be this uh, pretty dense, uh, interesting neighborhood with a lot of different handwritings and in that way a real diversity and not just different facades. Um, to this morning we got this uh, image that this is the building documents, the construction documents that are handed in in, in, uh, in Mexico today. So this leads me to a very short uh, next thing which is um, that our other first project in Switzerland was um, uh, a space of uh, underground parking which we somehow were able to do because the client did not understand what we do. Uh, it was one of these big companies who uh, thought, yeah, we will then cut the costs on top, but we already did the parking, which uh, we thought is interesting because this 180 meter long parking um, is uh, the main space of arrival and it has natural light and it has a beautiful structure and we understood that that is the 
that is um, whether a, they would have said no, no, just the cheapest parking. But we did the drawings, and and it was uh, it was pretty cheap to do. So we saw that there is a potential to just work with the main structure in a way that it cannot easily be uh, changed anymore. So this was the background we had. Um, and this this topic of structure where we understood that the main structure is our biggest help to do something which cannot be changed, even if then on top you have uh, strange appliances. So we were invited to a competition in Berlin for um, a fashion center. This is a building next to it, which was the model. We understood that it has big windows, it has uh, these arches, and it does exactly what they want. So what we want to do is to give them the same in new. Uh, so we were searching different structures, different ways to do something which is good enough to just put a table and a chair and the hang a, a, a cloth, and then it's a, it's a good fashion space. So we started to work with these arches to understand how can we get a space where Wherever you take a photograph, you will have, um, you will know which is the building inside and outside. We have these mighty kind of big concrete elements that are hung to that same structure to produce an outside effect of the same. A very simple building, all just straight lines, all just just these arches that are now an event space or were an event space. Now it's the Porsche lab, um, upper part is like Puma, this is like the, these spaces where people who want to buy clothes, uh, professionals go and buy, and all that in a building which wherever you, whenever you see an image of it, you will understand this is that building. So we then had to, the funny moments of doing even a stair, and today this is uh, not real. <laughs> Trigger warning. Um, this is uh, this is uh, from uh, six six. What sense eight? Yeah, on a, a Netflix series where they use our building to make it explode uh, for the series. Um, and uh, of course, then you get always this uh, kind of. Did you see? It's now in the Porsche ad. It's now in the Suzuki ad. And so, so it's a building that really functions on the level of structure being also then the visual structure and being something that you can hurt. I would like now to <laughs> invite Tilo. We thought we would do very cool handovers, <coughs> but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would like to show you uh, a few of our housing projects um, in, in Europe. The first one um, is a commission in Basel, where it was a situation with three um, old buildings uh, on a corner, and all owned by the, by the same family. And like, we just added a new part um, into this whole complex. There was like the same old building like on the left side, but this was in a rundown run state. Opposite there, um, you're directly uh, on the park, so we were looking for a for a building which is organized very vertical, and where the facade already is kind of the first step. Of, if you go to the balcony, you are just like going into the park. So um, this is one side. The other side is is kind of the the opposite, very grey and very messy um, courtyard. And here you already see that it's it's a. Uh, it's the new building is kind of connecting everything into one new shape. Um, it is organized here, like the organization is is uh, quite simple. The one, the corner building, the like the dark green. This was just a refurbishment, and so like also one of the of the aims was that like people were already living there. It was a very good group of, of artists and um, uh, like from, from the theater, musicians. So we didn't want to have like this gentrification. So we, we tried that people who liked each other as neighbors could stay there. So we had also like a plan who could move in which apartment, when, and <laughs> could go into the other one during the whole process. So like one was just refurbishment. Then 
the gray one is half new and half old, and the green one is this new edition, which is combining every, everything. And what we did, we added a new uh, staircase in the center, which was the former courtyard, and just like the old staircases of the old buildings were then just integrated into the apartments. Um, so there was also like completely different conditions between like old and new, and there we tried to work with kind of a figure ground so that we have like one that the the new space is like completely different to the old one, so it's like one big room, but one big room which is not uh, like obviously open. So there is always niches and you can never see the whole, um, the whole room at once. So what we did, we just like thickened the, the walls, the, the, the firewalls of the, of the neighbor's building and integrating there like uh, the technical spaces or the bathrooms. And with this operation, this was another thing that we were like also building already possibilities for the future. So it, it's a floor plan. There will be a kitchen, of course, but we already integrated like, all the tubes and electricity for the possibility to have like the kitchen in every niche. So it also happened that someone bought an apartment and he said, oh no, there's like the position of the kitchen where it is. It's not what we want. So they changed it in, an, in another corner. So it's, um, the idea was also that it, this building can, can kind of grow during its whole lifetime so that we as architects don't like, give the precise decision of what it has to be, but giving options. Um, just a quick tour through, the, through the, the empty space. This is where you enter the new apartment. So you are on a little bit higher level because like, you have a different floor heights on the new and the old buildings. Um, you enter, you're already like in this in-between space half outside because like directly in front of you is one of the balconies and you have like the, the original view um, into this huge space looking back. Um, this is then the view to the, to the park side, the other side, and you, you can here you can already like feel that you're in a in a big space, but at the same time you have always something which is quite, um, you're, where you not are exposed completely, um, and where you can have like your own corner within this uh, open space. Um, an enfil enfilade through one of these like thick walls. Here it's a, it's a bathroom, and then. Around the corner, it gets connected to the old building, and the old building is completely different also from the atmosphere. There, it's the, it's the old floor, so the sound is completely different, it smells completely different, and we just left everything as it was, and it's kind of a, of a very um, uh, brutal like combination of old and new at once. And what I didn't tell before, it's also like with these um, three houses, it's you have the possibility to have like three apartments on on one floor, or you can can um, connect them and just make a very large one, which has like a, a more public area um, with the with the dining room and everything else, and a, a more private one, which is kind of disconnected and with a completely different atmosphere um, at the other side. Um, then I just wanted to show what happened after it was, what, so when it was built. So it's always exactly the same floor plan, but like the atmosphere and how it's used is completely different in, in, every, in every floor. So this is uh, now, for example, the, the attic apartment with uh, like someone who is uh, liking to cook very much. So it's Simon's apartment. Um, and so it's a very dense moment than once or below. It's completely different. They have like the, the living room in the, in the middle and on the other side is the kitchen. They have a, a special um, bedroom at, at, at this floor where the others are completely open. This is like from a family which is very much into art and design. So they have more this kind of loft character. Um, and also it's this very open kitchen. So like also special atmospheric conditions are completely different in all um, the different different floors and it's also like 
uh, this is a situation from the in the ground floor where there is also a restaurant we, we could establish. So like with this operation of this corner, like we um, it was kind of also a reactivation of a, of a, of an of an urban plot which was kind of not so good before. Another building also in Basel. Um, this was a was an old house, like if, with kind of strange situation because it was a freestanding old house, built as a villa around 1880, and it was not touching the neighbor house. So we get commissioned to um, like optimize everything because this villa was then used as three apartments, but they had to share the corridor, for example. So it was kind of difficult to rent. So the new building now has uh, four apartments, and every apartment is completely different. It's just like a uh, maybe like a family house, but what we kept because we were so fascinating was that it was dispatched from the from the neighbor's building. So they have um, this one um, like this gap in between with a with a layer of balconies and and open space, which giving light through the whole uh, building in the whole depth, and it is very like, special situation. The floor plan was very much about um, modularity. So also here, the idea was that maybe space is a little bit too big, but it's within the square meters you can normally rent, so that you don't build everything. You, you could add a room, very simple, later, because there is like, it's a, everything is on a split level. So it also has also, every apartment has two entries, or entrances, so you could also then, this apartment could grow during like the family life. So if children are, are, are maybe very, very, uh, very small, it's just like family living together. They're getting older. Maybe they want to have like their own kind of own apartment, so they have like they can sneak out in the <laughs> on the second en entrance. Um, and uh, like the the flexibility of the floor plan was also like the size of the rooms is always done in a way that you could have living or dining or have an office there or you can combine living and dining um, in one space. So now focus is like on this on this gap in between the house um, which is also then giving light into the um, into the kitchen which is in the middle and would be a kind of this typical dark room in the in the center of a house. Um, Nighttime, it's the opposite. It's kind of lantern uh, for for the balcony. Um, this is now the kitchen, and it's really it's extremely bright situation, and uh, like a very special because like to have fresh air somewhere where you wouldn't have it normally. Like the light condition is is uh, very different on on every floor. So this is like on the um, like. Uh, on the on the attic floor, where you kind of facing this window also from the from the living room, this is a, like the situation with this um, balcony, which is but how it's organized more like a room or a space in itself. The um, living and dining area facing the, the the courtyard, and this is in the ground floor where you still have like a lot of light. Um, and with the white wall and the reflections, it's just like not a dark space, what it would have been if it, w if you wouldn't have like this gap. Next one was a was a funniest uh, building because like there was a family, they came to us and they said, we want the whole house, but we just have two thirds of a budget for a house. So, they. The question was, how can we can we build the whole house with two thirds of a budget? And there was like a creek under the house, so it, the conditions were, were not the easiest one to handle. So the um, first thing is what we decided not to have a cellar. So just like be on on uh, on original soil and just build everything on top of it. And whatever you you would have in a cellar normally is just like added on the outside. So like. What we did is we built like the opt optimum um, like volume for for uh, for insulation because like this is like the, the, the most expensive one so it's a square and it's a, a square and a square so a, a cube and 
the white part is just like this added space, which is like m giving more generosity to the inside, and like it contains um, like the technical, the storage, the entrance, which doesn't have to be heated, and like always like a very uh, spacious outdoor space. Uh, this is the upper floor. Um, this is the entrance situation. We work there with a uh, um, very cheap material, um, but like this extra space is just like um, also again a night kind of a lantern, and it, during daytime um, there was just like very it's a filtered light coming in. It's the same time it's a sunshade to the south side, and because like the sunscreen is on the outside, this. Um, Lodge is completely part of the of the living area, which is not too big, but with that operation, it looks much more generous than like by square meter it is. This is then the uh, this, the second lodge and the upper floor, which is kind of a very intimate outdoor space. The um, last one I want to show you is um, is a project which uh, was already then copied <laughs> by ourselves, kind of a, of a ready-made. So on the left side is House D, was the original one, and we built it, this got a European prize, and the family of Germany, they saw it in a book and said, we live in a house and we want to replace it by the same house. So it's just now, you always like a left and right, left is the original, and on the, on the right side is it's a kind of the copy, and it's like two different sorts, but they fit, fit quite good. Um, the, this house D is on a, in a very, very beautiful uh, situation. And the operation was like having a, a building which is layered in three layers. One is like digged in, in the ground. It's more like a cave. Then you have like, a very large platform with, with the whole view. This is got this white thing. And on top, it's um, kind of a cabin uh, with all the private, private rooms um, like in the in the other house this, um, in Germany, they have this existing cellar, so we, 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 we kept that one, built this kind of empty space above, and the, um, the roof again has, um, has all these private rooms. This is the situation uh, with this, um, uh, in, in this kind of cave uh, project, um, where we used a lot of like industrial materials, just um, like with plastic, uh, steel, and I mean, the house was very much about cars, so it is, it's a house for four cars and uh, one inhabitant, which is quite big. <laughs> and for them, we had to uh, make sure that this Ferrari uh, doesn't scratch while it goes into the garage. Um, this is the ground floor, and then like this empty empty space on the on the on the ground floor, facing like it's completely open and being part of the of the nature this is the the situation in in germany uh, the ground floor plan with it's interesting but if you see here inside like the the whole the whole living area is is kind of of one big terrace just separated with a very thin glass wall inside and outside um, situation a little bit different in germany um, and then on the this kind of, of cabin on on top, um, which is more like the cozy space, um, like very small windows. Just this is like a part where you are kind of hold um, when you when you when you want to retreat. So now I stage is yours, Simon. Thank you. Ab. I have to catch up. I realize we already knew that the, the last one is going to be the one um, making it up for <laughs> slightly longer. So, I mean, both Simon and Thiel already you know, slightly um, talked about this other thread, which we are very much interested in, is the idea of ready-mades. Uh, the first time we could consciously um, work on that topic was uh, Mark mentioned a project in upstate New York we built a couple of years ago together with Iowa Way. It's called the Art Farm, which was a um, low cost gallery space and uh, storage for contemporary art. And by using uh, prefabricated steel elements, usually um, um, 
used for agricultural purposes or industrial purposes, we could come up to to come up with something which we consider being interesting for a very little budget for roughly um, three thousand. Um, 4,000 square feet and uh, $300,000. Um, so, like, this idea of um, maximizing uh, the outcome and, and minimizing the effort was something uh, we were constantly discussing in, in, in different ways. Um, here, with the result that on this gallery space, um, we then... Um, it's basically a no design building. There's not one element which we ever drew. So everything which you see and which which was like how elements which were used and taken out of a catalog, um, with this slightly shiny PVC bat insulation, create a very strongly insulated and and uh, almost cut off space from the outside. And with this. Um, a lower exhibition space, a museum, a small office, and uh, like a, another small space for uh, um, um, hanging art and the storage part on top. And like this sort of ramp, uh, just like the back spine in the middle as an infrastructural element connecting these things. Something which we also, for example, for a small um, uh, a temporary um, booth for a, a vinyl for a contemporary music in, in Switzerland recently also used by just basically ordering all the elements uh, used for that on the internet with the exemption of like the connecting pieces of the scaffolding elements and everything else we could buy online. Um, Ready-made of course, also of ideas. You know, there's only so much ideas you s can somehow come up with and, and be interested in during a certain moment of time. Um, and when we um, have been asked to collaborate on this pilgrimage path in, in, in Mexico a couple of years ago, another of these group projects, Sam mentioned before, of um, Ruta de Belgrino, which was um, curated by um, Tatiana Bilbao and uh, Derek Duncan from Mexico. It's a pilgrimage path, which is uh, roughly 120 20 kilometers long. It's um, it's a couple of millions of people. It's really hard to believe this is um, that um, popular. Um, walking and taking their really heavy path under their feet. Um, it's becoming a, a it's became a, a important economical factor if uh, people come up and uh, trying to sell um, small goods. And when we were uh, working on that, it was the time we were actually working on the on the labels project, and we were we were interested in the structure and this idea of of arches and what the, the, this main structure could explore. This is Tatiana's open chapel, which is making the beginning of that path a very beautiful um, sort of uh, center open space for congregation. Um, Iwaways lookout point, which uh, was built. Uh, not exactly he had it in mind, Chris Gottenbein's uh, chapel, um, some shelters designed by our Mexican colleague Luis Aldrete, which is basically just uh, uh, a shell for uh, putting your mattress and cleaning and washing off the dirt and staying and for a couple of hours. Um, the beautiful um, concrete ring in the middle of the woods by Derek Tellenkamp, a pavilion by Elemental, Alejandro Rivera, which is another outlook point. And our project, what we proposed, uh, we had this idea of, of creating sort of a loop um, so that um, people and walking there could actually come up and have an idea where they're coming from. They, they, they would go on. And so this is this um, research which we were doing at the time, working on this um, fashion center, and trying to use this idea of arches to maybe produce something more dynamic. Again, this um, um, uh, almost like naive idea of how um, construction could be controlled uh, um, from afar. And um, with this drawing showing always the same um, foam work uh, for actually come up with it eventually would be something quite uh, spatially uh, complex, or uh, at least we considered it interesting. And we were quite happy and astonished to, to see that the outcome was uh, very much as we would hoped it's going to be. 
Um, this was very much at the beginning when it was so clean and neat. Now it's not looking like that at, at all. Uh, this, um, it's also used for cows for shading, as you can see on this one. Um, one of the important things, um, people walking and families walking, they'll, they'll leave a trace. So um, they inscript their name on, 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 um, on, the, on the construction, on the wall. They're, they have spray on, the graffiti. Um, so it's becoming really taken over. It's becoming a really public, public space. And this is out an excerpt of a, of a movie we could do with a Mexican fil filmmaker and artist for the Biennale in Venice um, four years ago. Very, um, which very beautiful shows like the motivation of the people and which of course often is a religious purpose but also just like friends you know walking together and um, you know, saying thank you for life and um, so you see this really taken over um, by all these graffitis and inscription. Another idea, but again, working with this um, idea of ready-mades a couple of years ago with AWP, Mark mentioned that in his introduction too, uh, we won a competition in, on the outskirts of Paris for um, somehow uh, remarking or um, a territory which was not used to be uh, um, a park, which would, should become a park with very little means. So Agence Terre, the landscape architects, won a competition to do that. And we got the means to almost in hom homeopathic doses to cry to, to some sort of rebrand or brand this, this site by, by different follies and pavilions. Um, this is this park and whoever has already been at the Villa Sawa in Poissy, this is in Poissy, so this is the Villa Sawa on, um, on the lower end here in Paris. And very much intrigued by this informal housing floating there. Um, on, on, on the site itself, we proposed a series of, of, of barges and, and simple, simple shapes and buildings, always based on, on um, prefab wood or steel elements. And for now, two of them, them have been built. One of them um, being this observatory building, which um, is a, a small tower of about 30 meters high. Um, uh, pr pretty complex in construction, so um, uh, structural, structurally complex. Uh, we had a hard time to actually solve it, and together with the, uh, uh, our friend and um, engineer from Switzerland, uh, T.B. Pushkas, uh, suddenly we um, came up with this idea. We basically, they came up that basically, why don't we whatever is. Um, existing in that design, why we, we, it should be used structurally, and that's then how we made it happen. So the stair, each staircase, like the balustrade, everything is structurally needed, and so like this we could create this almost um, strange um, uh, insect object um, offering this outlook over the park. Um, the second thing which we were able to build um, was this, um, it's a small uh, a museum for a collection of insects and educational projects on, on plants and insects in that park, which is um, in, related to this idea, but it's based on a wood construction, where we try to have a series of, of spaces, very simple spaces, by, uh, but at the same time trying to create a continuous open space and using these exposed structures to almost like insect legs to have where um, when you go from one space into the other uh, to, to have an open, um, continuous uh, floor plan and always with a strong relation to, to, the, to the nature, to the park itself. This somehow proved to be um, quite popular and this led us to uh, I show quickly to end that and to maybe start uh, the discussion. Um, two projects we have recently been working on, uh, one of them uh, being um, a, a, a competition we unfortunately lost to the OMA's um, com um, convention center in, in Toulouse where we have been proposing a hotel complex, uh, again, using this idea of an expressive structure for some sort of very public 
big open, uh, we would call it soft space on, on, in our office, this sort of half public um, space, which um, is somehow the common ground for different types of hotels for a series of, of um, three, four, and um, five-star hotels, and using um, uh, sort of a common uh, big lobby space as a uh, to, to, to gather and collect all the the, uh, the, the, the public um, amenities together. And last, I'm going to show a project we're actually working on in the office right these days. It's a project which we will, uh, which we handed in, but we will present it on on Monday. So, wish us luck. It's a very long and extremely complicated process in Paris. We do it with our friends from 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 Paris and um, Prüter. And it's um, it's it's part of this reinventing Paris um, projects where um, a group of architects and investors and artists and sociological uh, specialists and um, have to come up with an idea what to do and then make a proposal to the city on a certain site. A very unusual um, process. That's why it's taken so long. And the site is right next to Parc de la Villette, which you might know from uh, Bernard Chumi's red famous pavilions, and also like from the concert hall, uh, for example, uh, Jean Nouvel's concert hall. And it's that large site, which is just along the highway with a dimension in the middle. You see that it's uh, the turbine hall of, of, the, of Tate Modern. And um, what we got was a very, very huge program, which was a lot of them, almost more than half. You see the black one is, is, the, is office. And um, the rest would uh, be a program which is in close relationship to the musical um, microcosm of that Parc de la Villette, which is all related to music and classical music and education and music. And realizing how uninteresting and, and empty and um, also unused and underused these spaces on the ground floor are, are on this, even if there is something, if there is no one walking by. Um, and very much intrigued by these sketches. Uh, um, to, to come up with a very complex hybrid building. Um, we were looking for different ways how to, to come up with a, with a very dense project. And then when we started to realize that actually we could almost like separate the program in um, part really um, on the left side, um, more related to music and the right side to, to um, the office part, which actually needs air. We very much based the whole project on this idea of in this on this um, section by Marcel Breuer in used for the Whitney Museum, where it's like cutting in and creating a public space by going underground, and so that we put we propose to uh, to have all the standard and office program on top and to create a, um, um, a public uh, possibly public space on the ground floor and underneath that standard program. At the same time, using, uh, uh, creating a very simple, very big building, going through the section briefly. There's a, um, a concert hall and public space on the ground floor there uh, with a garden um, on, the, on, the lower, on, the two, on the on the low floor. There's um, a very strange situation of a towing zone of the city of Paris, which has to be kept on that for a couple of years, which eventually then could become something different in the future. Um, to maximize somehow in that incredible density, uh, the idea of, of having um, sunken in gardens and, and green spaces, which mediate to the, to the ground floor and to the, to the um, pedestrian zone. And um, on the inside, there's an uh, idea of a, of a courtyard, a public courtyard, and another public space on, on the roof, always in relation to the Parc de la Villette, um, all gathered in an extremely massive, big building. But uh, we, are also intrigued, we were also very much intrigued and interested in, in some certain neutrality of the building and its expression in the neutrality of, also of the usage, like testing what kind of usage and what kind of floor plans could eventually be um, adapted and used on that. And also when we now, when we we're looking um, for the expression for the facade, would it be something which 
does it how much does it have it actually to reveal of its use of housing and um, could it look something which is more housing or could it be something which has to be like a, a office or um, how much could it be flexible and and un and neutral for for future uses uh, that's what we that's the state where we actually are right now it's of course not finished um, always trying to 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 create a counterpart to this um, to this heavy cornerstone of the of the Parc de la Villette and the symphony, and um, imagining that it would create some sort of continuity. So that's where we are. We 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 will um, no more. We will <laughs> no more next week, and uh, I think we open it up for discussions. Eh? I'll start. Yeah. I'll start. Well, I'll start with, I think, uh, in a candid way, this, first of all, this interest huh, of this, this lineage of modern architecture in Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia. The thing is, I'm thinking about that show first when we saw each other and how it was a moment where there was a utopian project in Yugoslavia and architecture played a very important role to shape that national identity. <laughs> And also today, there's an interest of the younger generation uh, of that architecture, not only because of its utopian stance, but because it was a moment where for 40 years it really united a country that is now no, no more. I, I'm curious in terms of the interest in that aesthetic, whereas you, the way you are practicing now, which I believe I'm practicing too in a much more neoliberal global world, but at the same time, we, we don't practice in a world where we're not talking about in the 70s, where a global architect is uh, jet-setting around in a concord. You know, we're dealing with situations where um, uh, we would do something for three business class tickets to Brazil or clients with two-thirds of a budget, you know, although with the aspirations of a Ferrari. You know, so I, I'm, I'm interested in uh, how do you see your work, your, you operating right now? You know, you're based in Switzerland, you're doing all these different collaborations in different countries, and how, how do you see the, the, this kind of interest? You know, what holds all these projects together? You know, there's a certain, whether it be formal or aesthetic direction or a conceptual direction that begins to unite all these type of disparate projects. Yeah. Maybe if I... Um Quickly reply to that. Um, I think that that uh, although the shapes of all this architecture of yes, I, I think it's pretty correct that you also take Czechoslovakia and so in the the ballot. Um, that was all pretty um, on shaky grounds. No, I mean it's it's very expressive, but these were not um, the the kind of like the business architects doing that. No, they were all trying to disguise how weak construction behind was. They all had to kind of deal with difficult situations. Uh, um, trying to make things that are much look much more modern than they are, and this is, I think, also something we have. I mean, if a, if a family comes and says um, we would like to have a house and it should have this, 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 and that, and we don't have the money for that, maybe that is closer to the question they had than. Um, what it seems at the first sense, because at uh, the first sight, because yes, it, it's um, it's maybe exuberant. Yes, it's maybe uh, expressive, but that w why I think it's so good as architecture is because um, normally these buildings uh, get their expression and their meaning from the very the most necessary uh, uh, the, the the things that are most necessary. Yeah. You understand what I mean. Yeah, that's in a way, there's a, there's a gap between what you can do and the aspiration of what the project wants to be. That yes. becomes the content of the work. And I think in many of our projects, one can see that. No? There is this kind of, it's slightly, it's not as, it's not all Armani, you know? And uh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Since you do so much work in other countries, I'm curious to find out, do you often have to partner with local architects to understand building regulations, or do you take a lot of time finding that out for yourself? How, how does that work for you? 
it's, it's, it's definitely both, and it's in, 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 it's in any case very different. But um, I mean, we don't come there as specialists, of course. So we always have to to find out what's the, what's the link. What can we actually bring there? You know? And um, uh, I mean, for on I mean, you saw that we do a lot of collaborations now. And I think that's something which we think is extremely important. We are already a collaborative studio, so by by nature, like being being three of us, and you know, being and and collaborating with other studios and other architects and other uh, you know specialists and people from other uh, um, cultural backgrounds. Of course, it always changes. No, it never. There's no. There's no. There's nothing safe in our office now. There's always we always are on 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 like on on, such, on shaky grounds on all levels now. Um, and I think this is also extremely productive. And to give to give an answer to your question, um, yes, we uh, uh, we could, you know we always have local partners, of course. You know, uh, it may it be architects, may it be engineers. You know, this depends then on on the, ta on, the on the program and, and the actual situation. Yes, but but I mean, it's also just true that we always. Um, Maybe in the beginning, think they will tell us the local partners. But if you do social housing in Mexico, you have to understand the difference between how many square meters is allowed for this or for the other operator, and how. Is, so in the end, you end up a specialist if you want or not, because otherwise you cannot even be creative in these fields. And I think it's the same for construction. So what is nice is that you can start as the dummy you are no you come to the table and you say excuse me uh, can you explain me because i don't know no this is maybe less allowed when we have a, a project in switzerland although we function like that a lot <laughs> in many places no but so it's it's uh, i think this is the, um, uh, the, the the beginning is maybe guided but in the end we have to know all these things otherwise it doesn't happen thank you thank you thank you I mean, and of course, the result is an extremely diverse work and diverse portfolio, which is again um, not easy to uh, always for us to work with because it's not clear. For I mean, I understand the question. It's not so easy to grab for what we are standing for. And uh, but I think we are just um, by nature very curious. I think that's that's and I think that's what we uh, what is basically driving us. Uh, and. Um, and I think all architects, we know that situation. Usually you get asked for always the same things. And once uh, clients, once people think that it's, uh, once you have done something, you're going to do it better. And I think that's a misunderstanding of architecture by, by nature. No? Uh, so in, in the <clears throat> presentation, you were questioning the tra traditional role of architects uh, in, in some slides. That's what I understood. And do you see it as a... Uh, like a mere response to the change of like social like uh, requirement to architects, or are you trying to actually challenge and try to change the role of architect? I can try. I mean, um, I think it's a very. I mean, it's the what what we. I mean, we try, we try to um, understand what is the potential of the role we have. And it's, um, I think, the, 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 in your question is, I would say, is the fir for me, the first uh, disagreement on my side is that I don't think that this classical role of the architect still exists so much. So and there are many different ways how to do architecture. There is maybe a very business-like way how to do, and this is successful. But I mean, according to what, what operations you do and with whom you work, you have to adapt. You know? And we, I mean, I remember that years after we founded the office, we had the first contract, which was a real contract, you know, according to AIA, or you know, that would be. So we had to. Uh, I think we called um, the office of Emmanuel Christ, 
if they can send us one, you know, like they help us and so. And they said, "What is wrong with you guys? I mean, you, pro yeah, I mean, how many years do you do that?" And because we never had clients who were even close to, like, would we be pay an official contract? No, or yeah. So and and um, so maybe it's our bias, but I don't think that um, that there is the profession and this profession, uh, this change, yes, it changes, but they change all these different kinds of doing architecture. And I think it's more and more, our condition is more and more the condition of everyone in the field. And that's good, of course. This question back there. Yeah, so uh, thank you for your generous lectures and the amount of projects that you have shown us thank today. Thank you so much. Uh, so, in some of your projects, like the Houses DNC in Germany and Basel, the project in the Ruta del Peregrino, I believe, but also in this tower in the, uh, across the, in the park, in the Bilsawa, there is a strong uh, presence of the figure or the icon. So my question would be, how is your relationship with the idea of the figure, the icon, both how, how you relate to it when it comes to, into the project and when you decide to go for it? I mean, sometimes it's just like the icon is something to control, um, to control the client, maybe. So, like for example, this one, this um, fashion center in in, uh, in Berlin. When we started, it made us completely nervous that we thought, how can we deal with all these regulations? How can we deal with it that we won't make the interior? We just will build an empty building, and then someone else will, will, will just furnish it. And but for the client, it was very important that that um, that it is uh, his building always, and that he can kind of sell it on the market as a um, as a as something very special. So there, I mean, it was a strategical decision that that you design that, what cannot be touched, so it's the structure. So if the structure is already like this kind of um, icon or iconic part of the building, you will, you, you will kind of survive the whole process. And whatever will be changed with the soft parts of technique and how it's divided, it's, uh, it, it doesn't really matter. I, I, I totally agree, and I, I, I would like to add to that that um, we were maybe also we were young, we were stupid, we didn't understand that the client just didn't pay us the the um, Ausbau, um, the interior, fit. interior fittings. So I mean, he said no, we don't know yet, no, and so on. And then, but in the end, of course, we did that all, but not in a sense of special. Here should be this and that, but we did guidelines and it was built like that but it was an operation of uh, kind of young young architects and how to get down the the costs of the architects for the client but for us this was really i think a, a, a good beneficial thing because we tried to just do whatever we can within the limit of our contract which then was the main structure and so um, I think this iconic question of the, 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 the figure, no, is um, we try always to, to do something which is as, um, doing as much as it can in, in a good way. And sometimes this is very silent, sometimes it's loud, but um, uh, it's, it's, uh, if, you have a, if you have a client who asks for a building which, is, uh, which has a character, do that on 40 by 40 meters. I mean, you have to touch the structure, otherwise it's very expensive, no? You will have to go with light or so. What can you do with 40 by 40 meters is a basic question. So we discuss these questions and then we somehow say, I think this is our only shot. This is the shot where we can really do something which is different than what would happen if someone else uh, is like... <laughs> Uh, if someone else uh, would do the project. <laughs> I think this is also related to our you know, background as Swiss architects. Yeah? And um, 
you know, growing up and being educated in a, in a time where, like, you know, whatever you call it, but I mean, there's a, there's a certain idea of what Swiss architecture is standing for, and uh, always very much related to like the refined detail, like the simplicity of it. So for us, it was also like like freeing us from maybe these constraints and and like trying to be different and. I think this was always an extremely important part. And then, of course, I mean, as um, um, uh, Tilo was saying, this, you know, uh, how much um, effort can we have with how little means? And that's then when this, the, the construction, the, 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 the physical uh, structure comes into play again. And, and um, trying to not relate on any fitting and any detail. You know? So the structure has to be expressive, otherwise it's somehow taken over by whatever you know, comes later. I think that's important. Yes. Hi, thank you for that uh, wonderful lecture and showing us your work. Um, I know that you mentioned an influence which was Eastern European. I wondered if you also had some Italian influence from Carla Scarpa. When I look at some of that work, it has the same feel as Chumbrion or several of his other works. And I wondered if that was consciously or subconsciously part of your influence as well. I would say this is something we probably we all three have to answer uh, separately in a separate room. No? Also, we have like different education. Um, uh, you, you coming from a more Latin-oriented reference school, um, I would say in my education it didn't play a role. Of course, I know the work, and uh, uh, um, but it's not. It's never been consciously here. No? Um. Um, I, I I understand why you ask this, but I think that um, to me Scarpa is much more um, about the detail and much more controlled. No? We, we have maybe then a similar interest in what where things touch each other instead of just the, 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 the object itself, but w where it starts to be the end of the object and the, the transition into something else. But whereas uh, in my understanding of Scarpa, he then, that's where he starts to develop the detail from. Um, we would rather then leave things like crashing. You know? yeah. maybe, maybe just to summarize, because I thought that was an interesting question. Uh, because in your work, I see a lot of this combination between something maybe more Latin in terms of this kind of joyous expressiveness that is not in contrast with this kind of Teutonic, Germanic ideal of, of restraint. You know, I think this the is something old that's axis of there. the good, of the of the good. <laughs> <laughs> not placing any values on that, but but I think this this round of questions about. Um, you know, what does it mean to be a global architect? I thought of the analogy would be the difference between the Spanish and the Portuguese, where the Spanish at one point discovered new land because they had the naval might and they go out to conquer and to colonize, whereas the Portuguese had to go because there's no food at home. You know, but when they colonize, they become they begin to be more adaptive to the things that are in the new surroundings that they're in. And I, I think maybe you guys are more of the Portuguese, you know. Yeah, more than Italian. Cool. No, but I think it's interesting. I, I think yeah. for us it's interesting to see how what you learn with the collaborations, what you learn in these new situations and these challenging either fee structures or, or, or situations, how you can bring it back to your own culture. And, and this is something I think we're looking forward to see you explore with your students at the GSD. So thank, thank you again. Thank you. Thank thank you. you.